Hey everyone, Ben Cuba Radio, episode number 294. I'm quite impressed with myself because recently I've not been so hot on the numbers. Um, and I won't apologise because I've never been hot on the numbers. So there's no need to break a habit or apologise. I'm generally quite shit with numbers. Um, even when it comes to the podcast show and the numbers sitting at the beginning of the title, I get it. Um, right, we've got a guest on today's show. Uh, we're going to talk about actually a topic I've never, ever, ever talked about on the podcast. We're nearly four years into the podcast and we've never talked about it. Can you believe it? Well, um, some people describe this thing as similar to yoga. I've never actually done it. I've never really, I don't really know what it is. I'm going to find out what it is. We're also going to talk about a load of other cool stuff. And we brought an expert, Standard, onto the show to talk about it. Uh, Holly Grant, hello. Hi. Holly, um, thank you for coming on the show. This thing that I've yet to mention, <laughs> um, we'll get to, don't worry about that. Um, for the people that don't know who you are on the podcast, um, let them know who you are. What's the story? What is the background? Okay. Uh, well, it depends how much detail you want, but at the moment, I am I'm Holly Grant. Um, I am a Pilates instructor and a personal trainer, and I own a studio called Pilates PT, which is a one-to-one -one studio in Fulham in London. We also have an online plan, uh, which is personalized, and again, it's... Uh, it kind of incorporates the training techniques that we use in our studio. And I created a training technique called the model method, which is a combination of Pilates and hits. And that's kind of where the online plan comes from. And we have a book as well called the model method. So how did you get to where you are today? What's the story that got you into fitness? I'm intrigued as to where the passion came from. Yeah, I'll try and I'll try and summarise. It's quite a long story, really. Uh, but if I if I look back, my dad was in the parachute regiment, so I was a military child, and the parachute regiment are known for being um, sort of uh, very strong and very dedicated. And so I was brought up always being pushed to win. So I wasn't brought up like, oh, you know, it's, it doesn't matter if you didn't win, at least it was the taking part. I was brought up that if you're going to enter something, you better push yourself and make sure that you win. So I grew up being quite uh, a feminist as well. And then I went to a military boarding school and I decided that I wanted to be a pastry chef while I was there. So I was really decided I'm going to go to university, get a degree just, just in case it all goes wrong, and then I'm going to go and be a pastry chef. So I went to university, and actually, when I think back, I did psychology, and my dissertation was about eating disorders in first-year students at university. Uh, so that was, that was a, a big interest for me, women and eating disorders. And then I basically, during university, was coming back to London and doing work experience with William Curley, who was somebody I'd always wanted to work for. And, um, you know, he was really the best person you could work for. Did work experience with him. And so after university, moved to London. I lived in the smallest, worst little flat in Fulwell, which is even further out than Twickenham. And I was working as a pastry chef for a year. And basically after a year, I had really bad depression. I was really, really underweight purely because I had no money and I was constantly on my feet. And I just was so run down. Now, one day, I literally just couldn't go in again. I didn't do my notice period. I, I left them at Easter, which is probably the worst time because I was head of fresh chocolates. And it was just a really, really tough time. Um, so then I took a little bit of time out to decide what I wanted to do. And a friend of mine was working for a charity and her reception was based in a Pilates studio in Parsons Green. And she said, look, while you get your head together, why don't you come and be, they need a receptionist. Why don't you be the receptionist here and we can just have fun, mess about. So I got a job there as the receptionist and I just fell in love with Pilates straight away. And like most of the people probably listening today, I didn't know anything about Pilates. And so started working there. Then I was made manager and I was joining all the classes, loved it. I did a couple of charity events and I found Pilates was really, really helpful for endurance. And then the owner and the instructors were like, why don't you go do your training? Oh, we think you'd be really good. And so my the owner of the studio I was working in said, look, if you do go train, I'll hire you. Uh, so quit my job again, <laughs> um, went and did my Pilates training. And then it kind of went from there, really. I was working in a few studios, then I was made head trainer. 
then I did my uh, personal training qualifications because I knew that Pilates on its own wasn't quite enough and yeah then then I created the model method from there and yeah just it just went on and on but basically I'd always been fit I was a sprinter at school I had the you must win you must work hard mentality probably from my dad um I, I didn't have much money growing up so I knew I wanted my own business so I wanted to be able to make my own money and so I think all those things just led to to where I am now really so before we get on to what might be one of the key topics of today, I'm fascinated by some of the things that you sort of talked about in your journey. Do you have kids? Uh, no, I've literally just got married uh, a week ago. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't changed my name. No, the, the name. reason why I ask is because you talked about your dad instilling this habit of like pushing yourself. There's, there's no second place. Like, Do you agree with that? Because I know in education and children, like, there's quite a divide of opinion. Like some parents are like, look, come on, it's the reality. Like if you lose, you lose. And there's some people that are, you know, giving medals to all people in all walks of life. Like, don't worry, you tried your best. Do you agree with that? So I'm probably sitting on the fence here. I'm kind of halfway between the two because if, if I look at what I, the messaging I give my clients, especially because I'm actually very, I think I would say I'm probably very different to a lot of the other personal trainers out there in that I am, uh, I'm from a non-diet approach and I, weight inclusive. So I don't, uh, we do not even like to discuss weight in my studio and we're not about trying to make people lose weight. So a lot of my messaging to my, especially my female clients is, you know, just you don't have to be perfect. It's okay to be normal and average. You don't have to be the most beautiful woman on the school gates. You don't have to be the slimmest of all your friends. And this sort of non-competitive um, side to women, trying to get them to stop doing that, but be a little bit competitive with themselves mm. and want to be fitter and live longer and be able to jump higher, run faster, but not necessarily try and lose another kilogram um, so I think it, I think it's a real balance, but um, yeah, I'm I'm really competitive with myself. I tried to run from one side of the country to the other um, for charity a, a few years ago. It was eight marathons in eight days. I did seven, and I never let myself live it down that I couldn't do the eighth one. Oh shit! And I know it was it was it was like yeah, it was awful. Um, so I think I think there has to be a real balance, and I think there's. A, there are positives to being competitive and there's also negatives. I think it's being really self-aware of whether you are using that competitiveness in a healthy, balanced, positive way. Mm. Um, but yeah, I would bring my children up to, especially when it comes to fitness, to, to know that it's not easy and you do have to work hard. And if you want to do well, you have to rough it sometimes. You have to go through bad times um, and you have to work hard. Mm. I think the problem is in fitness and probably life in general is that people try and want to live by absolutes and it's you know I totally agree with your message I agree with all of it and one of the things I talk about quite a bit is self-love and people mm. people really struggle with that because in the fitness industry we're looking to always progress yourself and sometimes people struggle with loving yourself and moving forward rather than saying, oh, I don't like where I'm at, I'm moving forward, but you'll always be moving forward, so you have to come from a place of self-love, and it's not, you can't be absolute in either of those camps, they have to yeah. amalgamate themselves, and I think it's similar with this conversation, is that, you know, we don't want to say there's only one winner, because the reality is you can win at whatever you're trying to do on a personal level, but we still have to be realistic that chances are whatever you're trying to do is going to take a semblance of hard work. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, for the last sort of seven or eight years, I've had women coming to my sessions, sitting there and saying, I hate this bit. I don't like this bit. I've got like, how can I get rid of these bits? Like pointing to all these parts of their body and they're absolutely beautiful, amazing women. Some of these, are, you know, like really big career women, you know, they've done so well in so many different areas or have lovely children, lovely husband but hate their bodies so much and for us it's about changing people's goals um to like you said you know you don't have to be the best but maybe you know beating your own pbs and and like you said being realistic that you know if you want to be healthier and fitter and happier and love your body more you have to put some effort in but it doesn't have to be it needs to be with self-love. It needs to be because you love yourself, not because you hate yourself. And I know that that 
sentence has been thrown around so much by the fitness industry, like exercise because you love yourself, not hate yourself. But I do think it's so true. If you exercise because you hate your body or you hate how much you weigh or you hate yourself and you look in the mirror, it's always probably going to be a very negative experience. But if you do it because you want to be able to run around with your children in the park or you don't want to have back pain or you want to be there for your grandchildren, I think it's a much more positive experience. Mm. There's, uh, I was having a conversation with someone uh, the other day and I hadn't, I hadn't actually put it to myself like this before, but with the advent of social media, we follow what might seem like a lot of perfect people. And I said, if you, if you follow a lot of perfect people, I would advise you unfollow them uh-huh. and I would try and find a lot of awesome, imperfect people. And I started to talk to them about all the things that I'd struggled with on every level. And I said, look, I've been obese and I've got stretch marks and I've got you know looser skin as a result of that. I've suffered with IBS, ADHD, eczema, my right arm can't straighten. I've got one pec bigger than the other. My the top of my hips are always in pain from you know rugby and there's certain things that I can't do in the gym. Like I'm not that strong. And I just went and listed all these things and they just stood there and looked at me and went, "Yeah, but you're this." And I said, yeah, but "You're now focusing on the one thing that I'm better than you at or that you want." I said, "Take all that away. If you were slimmer and more athletic, you'd have many of the layers that I do right now." It's just that you're not looking at my layers of imperfections. You're looking at the one thing that you see that I've got that you've won. Mm -hmm. And it's just a case of reframing this stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's why social media is great in lots of ways. And there are lots of amazing people out there trying to promote body positivity and, um, you know, health at every size and trying to have a positive impact. But I... I, You know, my... Same as yours, I'm sure. My Instagram feed for a long time was lots of fitness personalities because that's the industry I work in and it's my and it's my business page and I in the end you know I don't think that it's damaging for the business I deleted pretty much a lot of the kind of I don't know what they would be called really but the kind of wellness influences off of my Instagram account because I just found that they were not having a positive impact on my opinion of myself and I'm pretty you know pretty good on that front um and I tell my clients to do the same thing as well. I'll try and follow people of all different sizes and ages and looks and abilities and success. Because if you're only ever looking at sort of 21 year old, beautiful personal trainers, you know, it does have a really negative effect on your own body confidence. And, you know, yes, yeah, same as you. I, you know, I'm 31. I'm not the, I don't have a six pack. I'll never have a six pack. Um, but also that doesn't necessarily matter. It's what, it's what you it's what you know, not necessarily how that you look in the fitness industry. Um, but I, I could go on a, off on a really big rant about social media. I think it's a really it's a double edged sword, really. Yeah, I I think a lot of people are talking about it at the moment, and I um I think I I talk about it a lot to my closed network because I want people to realise that social media is an incredibly valuable tool. It's a place to source incredible information, but you know, I tell people putting my phone on aeroplane mode is one of the most enjoyable moments of my day because I want peace in my life as well as I want busyness and action and energy. But not there's a huge amount of people that are not brave enough, you know, to even turn off their phone for a couple of hours because, you know, they think there's going to be some freak emergency or, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know they're going to miss out on the, the, the next um, dopamine fix from a, a a Facebook notification I'm like come on come Mm. on honestly this is not healthy mental well-being it's not a good place to be in no and I think for anyone listening who does spend a lot of time on social media um is really thinking about how an hour on social media makes you feel um because I think that especially with women with social media they'll follow accounts that they think might inspire them to exercise more or get exercise ideas from but the problem is that a lot of the people giving out this information and I know this is massively stereotyping so I guess I don't mean everybody but there are a lot of people out there whose sole job is um you know, social media and fitness and being an influencer and, and they are able to go to the gym every day and they are able to try all these different training techniques, you know, because often they're gifted to them. And if you are just like 
the rest of the general public and you have a nine to five job or you've got children or you have responsibilities or you're a carer, it's realizing that that's not normality and you're not less of a person because you're not able to exercise as often as they are. So I think it's great to get inspiration from people on social media, but also realize that, you know, that's not necessarily a true reflection of everyday life and mm. it's not a true reflection of the general population. Mm. Yeah, there's many social media people that are almost athletes now in mm. that it is their full-time job. I was speaking to one 100%. yesterday and, you know, this girl and, you know, she's done a fantastic job. But, you know, um, she has a, a lot of contracts that are, you know, with brands and stuff. And, you know, that that is the full-time thing. And I'm like, yeah. that, that affords you time to do that because it, it is your job. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying people just have to view that with a uh, a dose of reality and how that yeah. fits into their own lives. Um, right. Anyway, core mm. topic. I want to find <laughs> out about Pilates because I know sweet FA about it. When we were chatting before we came on the show, you said most people actually know sweet FA about it. I've got a friend who um, I very much admired when we were at school. He was an incredible rugby player. We all thought he was going to go on and uh, play for England. Kit Dobner, if you're if you're listening, and um, I remember he got a, he got a bad injury which ruled him out of rugby. And every time I've met up with him since, he will not stop going on about Pilates. <laughs> oh, you've got to go and try it, Ben. You got to go. And I'm like, there's this big rugby guy, legend, really nice guy. All he goes on about Pilates. Uh, Holly, let's start from the top. What's Pilates? Yeah. Okay, so it's probably easier to start with where Pilates came from. Okay. So someone genuinely created it who was called Joseph Pilates. And this was a guy who um, was, uh, I'd say it was, gosh, dates-wise, it's probably 100 years ago, I would have thought. Um, so Joseph Pilates, he um, was quite a sickly child, so there's always lots of different rumours about him, but I think he, he had um, he had lots of different illnesses when he was younger that made, meant that he was quite weak and he was um, at home an awful lot. And basically, he ended up becoming obsessed. I think a doctor gave him an anatomy book, and he became obsessed with anatomy. And he started to train himself up to become eventually uh, a boxer, an, um, uh, a gymnast. He was a few other things um, that were lots of kind of body weight training styles. And he became actually incredibly toned and strong and he wanted to look like the guys that were in these anatomical drawings and he then started he, he basically created something called contrology and uh, which is what pilates is now and it was using body weight to strengthen the body as a whole and he did lots of different things moved over to england he was um moved over to england he was he was interned or he was as he was um what's the word for it basically put in prison by the British during the war and he was training up other people that were also in prison with him who were very poorly and he started using bed springs and lots of different things to help create resistance and long story short he just he moved over to America and he set up a studio over there and he started training lots of dancers who found that it massively helped their flexibility and their strength and it eventually became Pilates and that was how it began. I think it's changed a little bit since then but the emphasis is still the same. So Pilates nowadays is a training technique that mainly uses body weight or apparatus such as a reformer which is almost like the double width of a rowing machine and it has springs and resistance and straps and pulleys um, and lots of other small pieces of equipment and you use them to strengthen the body as a whole the emphasis is on posture really um, but we improve posture by making sure that every muscle in the body is as strong as each other so we work on muscle imbalances and the reason it's so difficult to define it is because it's not like with weight training where you can picture somebody with some weights doing some movements and that's how you build strength. Pilates is so many different possible exercises that all have the same goal. Um, and 
often people will say to me, oh, you know, they'll, they'll say to me, oh, how's your yoga studio going? Or, oh, Pilates, it's a bit like yoga, isn't it? And if you ever say that to a Pilates instructor, they'll hate you inside <laughs> because it couldn't be more opposite. The, so the main difference is if you go do yoga at – really yoga is supposed to be about a way of life and yoga is supposed to be for a clear mind and you know um an easier soul basically it's supposed to be a way of life but if we take it as most people do they go there to be all flexible so yoga is mainly about flexibility and a byproduct of that is that you'll probably get stronger as well so you tend to find you might have more strength in your arms because there's a lot of mm. arm balancing pilates is about strength purely about strength and a byproduct of it will be that you'll probably get a bit more flexible because you'll open up your joints and give yourself a better range of movement so pilates is about strengthening the body we look at you we work out okay what's their resting body position for most of us i would say my bread and butter are people that sit over their desks all day so they have a really weak upper back um, they're really kyphotic so they hunch over because they lean forward so much, they then have to lift up their chins really high to still be able to see at their screens or look at people. So they get a really, really curved uh, back of the neck, which gives them migraines. We sit down too often, so we get lazy glutes and we get really tight hip flexors because they're always in a shortened position. And so when we then try and stand up, we then think, oh, God, my back hurts, my hips hurt, or I'm getting a load of neck ache. Um, and so Pilates would take that person and think, okay, so what's tight? what's weak and then we would work on reversing those using the opposing muscles so you can kind of see how long that's taken me to tell you yeah. why no one knows what pilates is because it's 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 not as simple as like saying de describing football or rowing or weight yeah, training sure. it sounds fascinating i am um, just from what you said i i feel i feel naive that i haven't had a go yet i feel like i i should have had a go uh, i don't think I've come across someone that, you know, speaking to you now, I'm like, okay, right. I've spoke to someone that's passionate about it. I feel a little bit inspired by it. I suppose I've not met anyone that's made me go, I need to come to your studio and actually try your Pilates. And I think mm. that's like anything in life. You need to stumble across someone that forces you to see that their passion could light a little fire within you or could add benefit to your lifestyle um, or physical. And I think for me, I'm always trying to develop myself physically my you just mentioned you know hip flexors hips in general you know as a rugby player my hips are a nightmare my shoulders mm -hmm. they're not too bad could be better upper traps i'm not too bad around there if i'm honest I'm all right. if you poke them what ha what happens any pain or does it feel okay no they're just they're just sitting there all swole don't worry <laughs> <laughs> so what would happen with you is you would come in and you would we'd get a bit, bit of background you play rugby you know you're very strong and we would talk about you know do you ever get any aches or pains you know are there any areas of the body that you know are a little bit weak and then we would something that people find a little bit strange is we would prod and poke and feel you um we would feel for your spine you know we would palpate your shoulder blades where do they sit in relation to where they should be sitting uh, often they're really far apart so we can say you know if you took your spine and you put your three fingers next to your spine I should feel the edge of your shoulder blade there if I don't they're too far apart and we need to fix that then and so we we build a picture up of what your skeleton is um and then we work out what do we need to do to make it perfect or the ideal posture so if it is that like most people they've they've their shoulder blades have spread apart because they sit forwards over a desk and they're reaching for their laptops all day so you imagine if you even do that at home now reach your arms forwards instantly your shoulder blades separate if we do that for too long which is most of us because we're, we're sat at work more than we're at the gym um those muscles in between your shoulder blades, so rhomboids, also your lats, um, traps, they all start to spread apart and it's like doing a stretch all day. So those muscles get longer, they are less able to contract, um, they are weak and long and then because of that your pecs at the front have shortened because they're always being shortened because your arms are reaching forwards so they get tight uh, and often quite strong so then when you try and stand up and pull your shoulder blades back together again which you see people doing all the time trying to improve their posture you can't hold that for very long because you're working against you know really weak um, 
uh, rhomboids and really tight pecs. And so we would look at you and think, okay, so what exercises can we do in Pilates that would strengthen the rhomboids and stretch out your pecs? And we're always trying to bring you, everyone back to this ideal posture. Got you. Got you. And it's hard. And I think the reason why people are, don't necessarily try Pilates, especially men, I'm afraid, at, at my studio, it's only men that are injured that ever come to us. And we always say to them, if you'd come here a year ago, you wouldn't be injured. Um, but it's because it's seen as being a bit of a grandma thing, you know, yeah. like old ladies in a church hall doing Pilates. But it is really, really hard. And we, I've trained all sorts of different people, rugby players, athletes, long distance runners, models, all different types of people. And the one thing that they that is always the same for all of them is it will always be hard because there is always a way of challenging somebody. Even if they have the strongest legs in the world, there will be a muscle in there that, that is weak and is really poor that we will find and we will make it stronger. So it is always going to be hard. Nice. So we've got a good idea of what Pilates is. We've got our potential idea of where it fits into people's kind of fitness regime you talked about the model method where where did fit training fit into this because Uh you trained as pilates first then you trained as a pt what made you amalgamate the two into what you feel is a method yeah so obviously i started off with pilates and i was teaching reform pilates which is on a machine which is amazing because any exercise that you can do on a piece of um you know gym equipment or cable equipment you can do on a reformer and so it's um it it just keeps your attention like nothing else i've been doing it for seven eight years now and there are still exercises that i'm finding now that are challenging and that are fun and it's it's almost like having a child on a on a machine because you know, you can't switch off because you're having to change springs, move the foot bar, put your leg up in this strap, now go do a head stand, shoulder stand. So it's always, re- it keeps people's interest for a long time. So I was finding that at the studio, I was having clients coming maybe three times a week, every week for years. And I was starting to get a bit bored of teaching them just Pilates. And I could see that they were coming to Pilates because they love toning work, but they hate cardio. And you just can't get away with doing one or the other. If we really want to be fit and healthy and live long lives and be healthy on the inside, we need to make sure that we're strong, but that we're also cardiovascular wise mm-hmm. fit. And I knew that um, people would come in and they'd say, you know, what, what, you know, what training do you do? And um, it was around the time of doing charity events. So I'd say, you know, I run to work and I do Pilates and I run home or I'll do spinning. And they'd always say, oh, I hate cardio. I hate running. I hate, I hate cycling. I hate swimming. So I had to start thinking, what can I introduce into these people's sessions that is going to improve their cardiovascular fitness but isn't going to be taking them for an hour's run? So I started doing research and I think because I did a psychology degree and because I don't like um, certain parts of the fitness industry, the pseudoscience part of it, I did my research into, you know, what what do athletes use and what does improve cardiovascular fitness quickly and HIIT kept coming out, high intensity interval training. Um, You know, the science backed it up as long as people didn't have any, you know, health conditions it seemed the the obvious answer. Um, so I did my personal training qualifications. And the one thing I was really surprised about was, and I think it highlights what Pilates really is, is that in Pilates, it takes a long time to qualify. And you have to do, you have to know every single muscle in the body, every single joint. Where does the muscle start? Where does it end? What does it do? What happens if it dies? What happens if it's weak? You have to know so much about how the body works. And I felt like, and this is no disrespect to any other personal trainer it's just an idea if you do ever want to increase your knowledge of anatomy I found the PT qualification was so basic and that was level three and um I felt that um there was there was no it was all about strength um and endurance and it was never about posture um so anyway I did my personal training qualifications and then I started on some of my private clients adding in sections of hit into their pilates sessions um a little bit of weight training and the results were just great these were women who would never push themselves out of their comfort zone and um you know would would never even think about picking up dumbbells or hated cardiovascular fitness and they were just becoming machines they were like mini athletes and you know body fat levels in some of them that were high were reduced they felt empowered they felt strong they were enjoying being strong which has always 
felt like a very masculine thing, they started to realize, actually, you know, I can jump and run and sprint and change direction and throw things. And I just really loved how it made my clients feel. And it basically just really took off from there. Um, and I called it the model method because like a model pupil, I felt like it was everything. It was like the perfect model. It was a combination of all the things that you need to be super, super fit. Um, yeah, so then, and I think we kind of got quite a lot of press off the back of it and we were training editors of magazines, which is always helpful because they'll always write about you. And yeah, that, that's kind of where it all came from. I just felt like it was an, an absolute no-brainer and I didn't know why somebody hadn't done it before. Sure. Okay, one of the things I'm always interested in understanding from other experts I get on the show is sort of primarily how they look to train their clients because I, I always want to look from an idealist perspective and then people will make a decision onto themselves of how they chop that up to where they're at. So like from a diet perspective, I might talk to someone that might be the ideal diet, like if we were to make the perfect diet, and then we kind of chop that back down to what's realistic, how much flexibility and balance they want, etc. So if you were to look at how you would want to train one of your clients from an idealist perspective, how many sessions a week would that look like in terms of Pilates, with HIIT training, and anything else that you would like to have in there as a coach? So it's a really tricky question because we've had people that have come five days a week. We've had people who come three days a week. The model method, in so you would come and you would do an hour session and it's on the reformer, the treadmill, TRX, dumbbells. We use a whole host of equipment in the studio. Um, so it'd be an hour session. And because you're doing HIIT and Pilates together, we don't encourage people to do it two days in a row because you need to give yourself 48 hours for your glycogen levels to come back up for you to be able to do hits well. So we, if someone came to us and said, look, I really want to get super fit and I'm really positive and I, you know, it's not about losing weight. I just want to be super strong, super healthy. We would say, you know, why don't you come here three times a week to do the model method? And in between those sessions, you know, it's up to you if you want to do walk to work or do a jog, nothing too high intensity um, or yoga. W one thing I'm not, um, one thing I don't like is people trying to monopolize and say, you should only do this. I think the more different things that people can in include into their workout regime, the better. So we, we do really promote people going and doing yoga and going and doing lots of other things. And, um, I think the thing is, we're not, it's not, I don't do this as a money making scheme. You know, like I work long, long hours and I don't really make much money if I'm honest. Um, but for me, it's a passion that there are so many women out there who hate their bodies and don't go to the gym because they find it really intimidating and they don't want to go try things like bouldering and rock climbing, which I love because it seems really intimidating and they don't want to be terrible at it. So they're just not doing anything. And so one of our biggest messages is it's the power of the mind. Like you've got to sort out what's in your head. It's not necessarily your body that's the issue. It's what's going up top. So even with our online plan, they do Pilates and they do HIIT, but we also partnered up with Headspace. So all our clients have to do Headspace as well. And then we have experts who discuss intuitive eating, um, sleep, you know, it's I think because of my psychology background, it's all these different things. And I don't think that it's as simple as just sort of giving somebody the ideal diet or giving someone the ideal training plan. It's like the whole package. And if they're happy in their head, um, they're more likely to want to exercise and want to eat healthier. Um, I don't know if that's answered your question, though. No. Oh, <laughs> we love a tangent. Don't worry. Yeah. No. I mean, I totally agree. Like I, So I launched a online program which sounds you know, similarish to yours called Fat Loss for Life. I launched that first time probably about 16 months ago and it, it started to be kind of like 20, 30% mindset and the rest of it was practical. And by 16 months later, it's probably now 60 to 70% mindset mm. and the rest of it's practical because everyone's got, the reason why people go and seek help is generally they have layers of things that they cannot solve themselves, whether it's a fear of success, a fear of change, a self-confidence confidence issue. Like There's just so many layers and a program of this nature for me had to enable someone to work through all those layers 
and just peel them back and you know get out of their own way because most people will stand in their own way when it comes to success it's not other people it's themselves and yeah i totally agree with you unless you're willing to take that step and most people view mindset work as fluffy and a bit no like, mm. you know, especially for men, it's a bit too out there. Like you're going to feel vulnerable. Well, unless you get comfortable with being vulnerable, be comfortable with not making the progress that you want to make. It's as simple as that for me. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think I think health professionals and fitness experts are starting to yeah realize the power of that because if it's it's what I think one in four women in uh, are, are obese in the UK and I've written it down here as well like some of the biggest some of the big the stats that for me just highlight why what we are promoting or what we have been promoting over the years where it's all weight loss based and it's all like clean up your diet exercise every day isn't working so one in four women are obese in the UK one in five of us in the UK are on a diet at any one point so one in five of us right now are on some form of a diet um, calorie restricting diets you um, it's been shown that if you try to calorie restrict you will put that weight on plus more so you end up heavier plus people who constantly try to stay at a, um, a sort of weight suppressed state um, have been shown to that it can can lead to binge eating disorder um, I think there was even a statistic where it was saying about how you might die younger if you're if people who are where is it? Those um, those who diet the most have a higher death rate than non-dieters. 75% of women want to take part in sports uh, but felt held back for fear of being judged on their appearance and their ability. Uh, only 10% of adults in the UK play sport regularly. Like there's all these awful, even even six, you know, 11 to 16 year old girls, 15 51% of girls that were asked between the age of 11 and 16 felt they needed to lose weight. 51% of young girls. Mm. And so something that we're doing isn't working. There is more. There are more free workouts online than there have ever been. There are free diet plans out there. There are more diet plan books out there than there ever have been. And something isn't working. And I think it's because we are trying to focus too heavily on diet Um that's the thing that I'm seeing the most in the studio. Women coming in and they're like, I eat really healthy. I don't eat sugar. I don't eat gluten. I don't eat wheat. I don't eat dairy. And I'm like, well, why? And they say, oh, you know, because, you know, I just heard that dairy is really bad for you. Okay, so what's the facts behind this? Like, where are you, mm -hmm. you know, are you intolerant? Um, and then also, you know, we're relying so heavily on diet that people just aren't exercising because it seems like it's so much easier to just restrict what they're eating than to actually go get their bodies moving. And I think the more we start realizing that actually you can stay healthy by exercising regularly and having a really positive relationship with exercise, that will mean you don't have to diet all the time and diets don't work and they do make you bigger. And people will just have a much better relationship and knowledge of their bodies. But women are coming in, they're saying, I hate my body, um, I, I, I want to lose a stone, why do you want to lose a stone? Well, I was happier when I was a stone lighter. Okay, so what was happening when you were a stone lighter? Well, I guess I didn't have children and, you know, I was, I had a better job or I was still married. You know, this, this, when you dig, you actually start to find that it's not their body that they're unhappy with. It's what's going on in their lives. Mm. And it may be if they work on their head first, everything else will just follow. They'll mm. have, you know, more energy and they'll be more positive and they'll want to get out and exercise more. So I think for me, I'm not big on here is the perfect training regime, here's the perfect diet, because it just doesn't work in reality mm -hmm. with the general public. Yeah, no, 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 I agree. Um, I just like to find out what people feel is is a sweet spot for their, their methodologies, because there's a lot of geeky people listening to this podcast and they want to know where um, the coach or the expert feels is a sweet spot. The fact that you said... You know, you don't really recommend high intensity training two days in a row. I love that because I just, it's very, very rare to find people that unless they're sleeping brilliantly, eating brilliantly, recovering brilliantly, you can just have that capacity to train really hard day on day. Mm -hmm. You know, athletes aren't doing it. They have hard days and they have easy skill based days or kind of like endurance blocks. Like they go through cycles. They're not, an athlete isn't in the trenches seven days a week, beast in the body. Like no one's body can handle it unless you're on no, a lot of drugs get injured. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, and people get injured and or just exactly. fucking tired and stuff 
So it, it's nice to hear that. Um, you know, people ask me now, how often do I get in the gym? And I say two to three days a week. And I'm like, anymore, I just I struggle. Like, it just beats me yeah. up. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, That's I'm playing rugby thing. on top of that, which is a tough sport to play. But still. Mm. That's it. If you, you know, for the for the clients that there are clients that do push and they say we want to come five days a week. And I'll tell you what, they are always the people that turn up late and they are the people that put in about 70 percent effort. Those that come three days a week, they turn up and they turn up on time and they give 100 percent. And I would much rather that. And you are more in, likely to get injured if you overtrain or if you do this same training techniques too often you know you've got to mix it up a little bit and use different energy systems and use different parts of the body and that's why I don't think anything is good every single day um, and you are more likely to get injured and let's be honest most of my clients are people that live in London and a London lifestyle is not necessarily relaxing and so it does increase your levels of cortisol which is a stress hormone which has been linked to lots of you know, it's got, it does have its benefits in some ways, but high levels of the stress hormone cortisol for long periods of time can increase your levels of visceral fat, which is fat around your middle, which can kill you, um, you know, and coronary heart disease. And if you, if you're in a really high pressure job, especially we get a lot of clients who work in finance, if you're in a high pressure job all day where you're constantly, you know, on the edge of your seat, making big decisions, and then you go to do a hit class every single e evening, you are not going to do that for very long before you completely burn out, you get injured or you get unwell. Mm. Right, so rounding out what we've been talking about on this show today, <laughs> if people, and I am, if people are inspired to maybe have a go with Pilates, even if they just go and see what it's about, how do you how do you find a good practitioner? Because I think like anything out there, there is very much good and bad practitioners. Are there any things that you would personally look out for or advise people on? Yeah. So uh, as with any training technique, uh, there are there are good training providers and there are less good training providers. And I think with Pilates. We've been quite lucky in that the two ways to train up to be a Pilates instructor are really thorough, good schools um, such as Stopped, who I trained with, Body Control, um, APPI, um, there will be others that I've missed off, or there are also, um, you know, training providers that teach people to be um you know, sort of gym floor and then level three PT where you can add on, do like a weekend Pilates course and it will be like a two day course. And they don't, they are, they just, they're not enough really to be, uh, to really do a good job of Pilates. So I would say look into where your instructors have trained, make sure they're from one of the big schools where it takes, you know, up to a year to become qualified and go based on, kind of recommendations really because one of the things we've found is that there have been people who go to a Pilates class and it might be a really generic cheap one because they don't spend too much money because in case they don't like it and then they go and it's a bit crap and they never do it again whereas there can be a really big difference between a good Pilates instructor and a bad one so try and take recommendations um, try to go to maybe a smaller studio rather than trying Pilates at your gym uh, there will be gyms where the Pilates classes are great so I'm not generalizing but you, if you were going for your first session, it might be worth going to a, a dedicated Pilates studio where the instructors will have to be of a high level of training because that's all they teach there. Mm. And you will more likely get a kind of classical Pilates session rather than something that's sort of mixed up with other other training styles. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I would say they're probably the main things where the person's been qualified with um, and if you know someone who went and enjoyed it. Mm. But also it's a lot about your personality. We, uh, with fitness in general, you could go to one spinning class and find it really boring and you could go to another spinning class and find it, you know, buzzing. So shop around as well. Different personalities might give you a different class. Mm. Just to end on that, I think I haven't emphasised it enough on the show because I get a lot of people asking me about recommendations for different practitioners and styles of training and stuff. And, you know, when we talk about a practitioner that values and is really credible at their job, their price will reflect their ability. It's like if you come and ask me for an hour of my time, 
my price will um, be dependent on how well I feel I can serve another person, how qualified I feel I am. And Holly, I'm sure you'll say the same about yourself. It's like if you look at a personal trainer, you walk into a personal, um, you know, gym that's got personal training for twenty pounds, and then you mm. you walk into a studio that's charging forty, forty five pounds. You've got to stand there as an individual and say, okay, if I spend twenty pounds, what service do I feel I will get? Will I even be spending my money wisely? And I would always say I'd much rather someone went and saw a really good practice, practitioner once or twice a month rather yeah. than, you know, a, a not so great practitioner every week. Because yeah. the expertise of an individual can get to the crux of a problem so, so quickly. Like I have mm-hmm. sessions with people and within 15 minutes we're at the heart of the issue. We're going deep. We're, 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 we're really ripping it apart. It's the same with, I'm a big fan of osteopaths. You go to a great osteopath and within 10 minutes he has sussed your body out just by watching it move. And he hasn't had to do 15 tests and write down goniometry measurements and all that shit because he's just so intuitive with his trade. So whoever you're seeking out, just make sure you you really stand back and think about the choice you're going to make. Because I know right now people are worried about spending their money on good practitioners. Well, like Holly said, do your homework. Mm. And and I think there is nothing better to spend your money on than your body. You know, so we, I've known people in the past sort of make comments about our price who wouldn't think twice about buying a brand new, really expensive handbag or new shoes or a really flash car. And they are all items that for a lot of people are bought because they're not happy with themselves or what's going on in their lives. And actually you you only get, you. it sounds like a cliche, but you do only get one body and take it from me seeing so many people with injuries and post-op. Once you are injured and being held back by your body you really appreciate just how important your body is and how it feels and if you ever if anyone out there has chronic back pain you'll understand that you know pain joint pain back pain and anything going wrong with the body is just so debilitating and I think if you were gonna invest in anything it really should be your body and also with Pilates, it costs a lot of money to train up to be a Pilates instructor, and that does tend to be why it's reflected in the price. Mm. Um, but it really, it really is worth seeing someone who's done it for a long time and can just look at you, like you said, in one session and be like, "This is what's wrong with you. This is why you feel this way every single day." And here's some exercises that you guys can do at home. Mm. Amazing, um, Holly. You have a book out. Hopefully, uh, you your information today has piqued the interest of some people. I assume your book is on the usual places like the Amazon machine, and is it in the is it in the shops? Yes, I think um, I think various shops. It's still sort of uh, trying to roll its way out, really, but it's definitely on Amazon. You can also buy it through my website. Um, but I think Amazon is normally the the best place to buy it, isn't it? Cool, and it's called the Model Method. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, the first, my main mission with the book is to try to almost unbrainwash people and and show them the alternative that it's inactivity that kills people not obesity and to to not make weight loss the constant goal so it's it's very um research based so there's a lot of studies in there to help get you to see um you know what dieting and what weight loss you know what the effect is on your body and actually if we really want to be healthy it's more about doing more exercise than trying to be to weigh less Uh, it also discusses exactly what obesity actually is and what fat is and the, the difference between subcutaneous fat and visceral fat and the health risks associated with different things. Um, so it's really about educating people on um, their bodies and there's three sections. One is about diet, so it's all about nourishing our bodies and we take the government's recommendations because they have a lot of very, very educated um people behind them and they have a lot of money behind them and they're not trying to sell a product or boost a brand they're trying to make us all as well as 
we, we take a lot of the information from the government statistics and break them down. There's lots of recipes, because obviously I used to be a chef. Um, and then there is a section all about Pilates, so you can learn what Pilates is. We talk about anatomy, what a muscle imbalance is. We discuss different muscles, so you can really learn you know, more about how your body works. And then there are Pilates exercises that are broken down into, you know, where you are weakest and where you're strongest. And then there's a section all about high intensity interval training. So the science behind it, what actually happens when we exercise. And again, exercise is broken down into sort of different parts of the body. So it's really taking everything that we try and teach in the studio and put it all into a book. Nice. Yeah. Um, I have to say the recipes in it do do give some inspiration. Like some, uh-huh. of the bre- I was looking at some of the breakfast things, and I was like, corn and lime for t- uh, fritters with avocado, rocket, sariachi. I was like, I was looking at that. I was like, I could even maybe concoct that from what's kicking around in my fridge right now. Because <laughs> I yeah. hate cookbooks that are like, oh, by the way, you've got to go and buy fourteen different ingredients for this dish. And I'm yeah. like, Fuck, come on. Yeah, we even mentioned that in the book. So my family are all from Yorkshire. I'm the only one that's sort of moved down here. And um, my oh, every Christmas I'll buy my mum like a nice healthy cookbook. And every year I, around January time I get the phone call like, Holly, what's pink Himalayan salt and where can I buy it from? Or mm-hmm. where's what's teff flour? So when I said I was writing the book, my mum said, can you please make sure that I can get the ingredients in my local Tesco's? And I was like done and so it is it's you it's as much as possible using ingredients that you will be able to find in most places and uh, um but they're all based around getting as i looked at what the government's recommendations were and then i looked at the statistics on what what are we actually eating as a as the uk and we weren't eating enough veg we're eating too much sugar we weren't probably eating enough fiber um things like that and so I based the recipes around that so I took the things that as a general public we're not getting enough of based the recipes around that and then just tried to make them as tasty as possible and quick and easy to make nice well I like the look of the book um all the best with it I hope it I hope it is going well and will go well if people want to find you on social media where is the place to follow you so I would say our Instagram account Account probably reflects us best uh, because it's a really honest, normal, um, informative, fact-based Instagram account, and that's at the Pilates PT. Uh, we're also on Twitter. That one is just Pilates PT, and we're also on Facebook. Um, and then on my website, which is www.pilatespt.co.uk we've got um, all about our studio based um, sessions we also teach group classes at Swetabetti on Carnaby Street in London uh, so you can find out about that and our online plan is also on there as well uh, so that's an eight week online plan um, where you get personalised hit and Pilates videos based on again what we see in your photos and what we learn in your consultation and you get a great box that's full of healthy products that gets sent to you, plus my book and resistance band. Um, and you also get headspace with that as well. And those expert articles. So that's a, a great way if you can't get to our sessions in London, it's a little bit more affordable as well. Um, and that's, yeah, that's all on the website. And we've got a podcast as well. What is the name of the podcast? It's the Strong Not Skinny podcast. And um, it's basically, it's, it's women, at, so far, all women who are not necessarily strong as in can lift very, very heavy weights, although I'm sure some of them can, but are are doing great things in their industry. So we've had um, Chloe Brotheridge, who is an anxiety expert. We've had Bentley, who's a chef. Um, we've had Anna Kessel, who is a sport, the sports editor for uh, The Telegraph, I think. Um, and she's also... Um, she is just an amazing, amazing woman helping with a charity called Women in Football, which is trying to get more women working in football. Um, so, yeah, we've had loads of incredible, strong women who all have a link to either wellness or fitness. Got yeah, Nice, nice. Um, just so everyone knows, you spell Holly, H-O-L-L-I-E. Grant. You do, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I just thought I'd clarify so you people don't go running around the internet finding the wrong person because I'm very good at that. 
<laughs> thank you holly uh thank you very much for giving your time up for the show um for everyone that's listening i hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more uh, about what we've talked about today uh please do go and check out the model method book or check out pilates pt on the web and on social media um i think holly's brought up some uh, really interesting talking points today it's been a pleasure talking to you holly so thank you thank you Thank you for having me on and we'll have to honestly we genuinely have to get you in for a pilates session we'll do it i'll bring the camera down people can <laughs> people laugh at how inflexible i am no holes barred Make it work. <laughs> <laughs> if you've enjoyed the podcast please do me a massive favor by sharing it tagging someone else in on social media when you see it crop up if you've never left a review for the show it would be amazing if you could do that that's ben uh no itunes ben coomba radio just drop a review in takes a couple of minutes um if you've come over from uh holly's network hello i hope you've enjoyed the show uh there's another 293 episodes you can get yourself <laughs> stuck into if you like all that remains for me to say is goodbye. I will see you again next week, next Thursday. The shows go up every Thursday as standard. And in the meantime, uh, stay awesome. Goodbye. Hey everyone, it's Radio, episode number 293.